Today, my guest on the show is Dr. Sean Baker. He's an orthopedic surgeon and author of The Carnivore Diet. Now, this is a man who eats red meat and pretty much only red meat. 98% of his nutrition is red meat. This is counterintuitive to basically every nutritional principle I learned growing up, eating all your vegetables, getting foods from the different various food groups. And so I had a friend about a year ago who decided that he wanted to try the carnivore diet and using himself as a guinea pig for about 30 days. After 30 days, things seemed to be moving in the right direction. He was losing weight. Continued to do that for about 90 days and things continued moving in the right direction. Subsequently, he had his blood tested. All his markers for his blood work were moving exactly the direction that they should have been. Cholesterol was lowering just off of eating red meat. And so in Dr. Baker's book, he makes a pretty compelling argument as to how the carnivore diet is sustainable for human life from a longevity standpoint. And since that, book has, was written, he now has thousands of use cases and the data from those use cases in essence to kind of prove or show or demonstrate how the carnivore diet actually functions. Quite frankly, it's kind of unusual. It's quite, quite Franklin. Quite fr got it. Quite Franklin. I've been excited to talk to you all week. I've been, uh, I read your book and uh, just, uh, yeah, so Good. Thanks for coming on, by the well, way. Yeah, I remember watching, you know, you going to war on TV, you know, several years back. And, and you know, I just recently started doing this jujitsu stuff as a 55 year old, crazy old guy. I'm really appreciating, you know, how long have you been doing it now? Probably a good about five, six months of consistent training. It's been a little bit. We moved in the middle of, of, of it. So it's been. Yeah, I started last spring and then I had to take about a three month break off because we moved. I, I'm starting to finally sort of you know, get that, start to get it a little bit. Yeah, you know, yeah, obviously yeah, I'm still a baby when it comes to skill and stuff like that, but it's, it's, it's coming along. I'm enjoying the hell out of it. It's a lot of fun. A lot of, a lot of it's exciting because you know, it's like, it's a new skill and you're like every week you're like, Oh, I can try this and try that. And it's been a lot of fun, but I was in, uh, I was in LA uh, last weekend at a, at a place called peerless uh, uh, jujitsu. And they had, they had, a, they had a quite a few UFC fight and they had a lot of, you know, high, some big wrestlers and it was my first kind of nogi experience which was definitely a change in in tempo for sure and slippery and slipping around and stuff. see i'm the exact opposite you, you almost have to twist my arm to get me to put the gi on because i'm just yeah when it, when it comes to gi jujitsu it's just uh that, it's not my thing i'm <laughs> i'm not i'm not great at it i don't uh i mean I, I see people grapple with the gi and i started off in gi jujitsu but um you know it's like my gi jujitsu really is just a low level bjj and so i'll, I'll grab certain things like I know I'm supposed to grab the sleeve I know I'm supposed to cross collar grip because I see people do it and and then I have a obviously have a good understanding of BJJ in general so I can get away with a lot of things but yeah no I'm like I'd rather just roll without the gi on you know I, I get it too and I would too now but I I, I was told to kind of learn in the gi it slows it down enough so yeah. you can kind of figure out what's going on a little better how did you find uh like your your, your body dexterity and whatnot starting at, at such a later age i know i mean i know you've talked about chronic injuries and pain and whatnot in your book like how, how did that feel to you and and how's your dexterity feel now after five months in compared to the the onset of it when i first went in it was just kind of a whole lot of you know a different type of fitness it was just complete confusion you know you're wasting your your, yeah. your, your energy because you don't know what you're doing you know you're just kind of struggling and you know it's a combination of getting better and knowing what i'm doing skillfully but i you know i've been more focused on training towards this rather than before it was a different i was i was trained to be a rower and before that i was training to be a highland games athlete. so i've had all these different athletic careers and you sort of focus the training and so i've worked more on some flexibility and dexterity and, and that type of stuff so it's, it's all coming along and uh I mean, it's not, I'm not going to say oh, yeah. I don't get sore and beat up because there's definitely days I wake up the next morning. I, you know, I yeah. need somebody to help me tie my shoes, you know, kind of thing. But, but that is, uh, you know, I, I don't find it to be that. I, I remember when I played high level rugby in my twenties, I remember, you know, like the next day it felt like somebody had beat me with a baseball bat head to toe. And I still get a little bit of that after, you know, a kind of a hard night of rolling, but it's, I don't feel any worse than I did in my twenties, quite honestly. And I'm, you know, I'm 55 now. And so, I usually can go, you know, several days in a row. Right, right now, I'm trying to figure out a pace where, you know, I can train and still continue to do the do the lifting stuff. Because I think as an older guy, th those things are important. I don't know if you're you're probably aware of this. But one of the most important 
components of injury pre prevention is strength. You know, we know that the studies indicate that strength training by far exceeds anything else when it, when it comes to preventing injuries. And behind that, you get things like proprioceptive training and then flexibility is kind of last on the list when it comes to sports industry injuries. So staying strong is, is, is part of the, part of the equation. I think for sure. I always tell people that in, in my week of training, if there's anything, like if I have a busy week and I can only do one thing, the, the, the last thing that gets cut from the list is my strength and conditioning work, because, you know, obviously that helps with maintaining muscle mass as you get older, bone density and everything else that comes with it. And I, and people are always shocked by that. Like, really? And I'm like, yeah. I, and I tell people, I said, listen, imagine right now, if you wanted to get ready for a half marathon, how long would it take you to get ready for a half a marathon? And, you know, you could, if you're in start with at least a decent base, you could probably get ready for a half marathon in maybe eight weeks, maybe 12 tops. But if you wanted to put on say five pounds of muscle, man, I mean, you're looking at a, at a minimum, a year investment. And as you get older, that's like, no, it's like a three year investment to put on five pounds of muscle. It's like, so I, I could personally, and I'm not a great runner, but I could personally get ready and run a half marathon in a couple months. But if I wanted to put on five pounds of muscle, I have at least, at least a year's worth of work. After a certain age, I've been at this for 40, yeah. God, 42 years of strength training. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been doing it forever. And, uh, you know, it's not that, uh, it gets, to do, but it's the, the, the level of work you got to do to put on five pounds. Absolutely. At, particularly after you reach a certain point, you know, the first five pounds are easy, but after you've put on 30, 40 pounds, more, like when I started this out, I was six foot, 140 pounds. I'm now six, five, 240 to 250. And the number of years it took me to get there was a long, long time. And for me to do, you know, even to put on two pounds of muscle in a year, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about that, you know, and it's something that you have to kind of be very, very. And so, these other sports, you know, you, you've got to kind of figure out where your priority is. So I, I just I like to, to maintain a certain level of performance, you know, across the board. Like I'd like to be able to deadlift this much and, you know, do this many push ups and that stuff. And then the rest of it's, you know, skill dependent, which is, uh, you know, really the fun part at this point. Yeah. That's actually what I, a lot of what I use my grappling for now is, uh, it's I'm, I'm there to learn a skill. Right. And so, uh, you know, particularly say like with the, the new, uh, like this new phase or this new generation of Brazilian jiu-jitsu is a lot of leg locking. So, you know, I'm going back into the school now and learning a lot of just different style of guard and movement that is not, that's not the way that my brain works with BJJ, but I'm forcing myself to learn these things because it just helps me become more fluid. And as well as like, if I have a better system to attack different limbs, great. But at the same time, I can at least learn to defend those things more efficiently, but it forces my brain to work. And then I'll, I'll depend on, you know, the either if I'm grappling, that'll be my cardio or just running or whatever it is. Like I, I kind of like sequester my thing. So it's like, this is specifically for my strength and conditioning. Like a lot of guys will depend on their grappling for a uh, strength work, you know, static holds and whatnot. And I'm like, no, I, I have just like you, I have like these specific markers that, that I want to hit with my strength conditioning stuff as well. Did you come to it from, from a wrestling background? I can't remember your, your, your background prior to. No, actually a lot, a lot of people think that I did. And I, I came from, so what in one of the things that intrigued me about you is that my background is kind of a bit like yours in that when I was in high school, I was uh six foot, and I graduated about 155 pounds. And then I hit a growth spurt my freshman year of college. And by about midway through my sophomore year, I was 6'1". I grew, you know, grew about an inch, inch and a half maybe, and uh, ended up weighing about 200 pounds. So I put on like 45 pounds, 40, 45 pounds within a year, year and a half of graduating high school. And I was, what happened was that the year I graduated was the year of the first UFC. And so I had gotten into martial arts because I grew up playing football. I got, I had gotten into martial arts because my, my senior year when football was over, like I was, I wasn't getting offered a scholarship. I just didn't have the God given talent for that sport, like the speed explosiveness that I needed. And so, cause I'm a mid range athlete. Like I have a bit of explosion, but I can maintain that for a duration, like kind of like a, like a CrossFit or I'd be great for CrossFit, but I don't do CrossFit, but, um, but that's the kind of athlete that I am. And it just happened that I have that kind of, talent and a good learning curve for martial arts. So I started off in a traditional stand-up martial art form. And then that later kind of migrated into some Muay Thai that then I started doing jujitsu. Cause what happened was I watched the first 
UFC and I was like, oh, like everybody else, I was like, just stand up, like just stand up. It's that easy. You know, you can walk away from this guy, just stand up. And, uh, and then after Hoist won the second one, I looked at my friends and I was only doing martial arts at the time just to learn how to defend myself if I ever needed it. And it was at that point I said, man, if you're going to learn how to fight on the street, you need to learn how to fight on the ground. So I started doing BJJ at that time. So the last component of my fight game was wrestling. And believe me, man, I got to a point in my career where I was, I was, I had begun fighting professionally and started like kind of moving up the ladder and had, there was like a bit of pride where I had to say, I'm going to take all this stuff and get rid of it and go into these wrestling rooms with just straight wrestlers and just get my butt handed to me on a daily basis and like swallow that ego, you know, cause you're like the gym killer in the, in the karate dojo or the boxing school, but then you come in these wrestling mats and you're just getting mopped up. And so there were several years of that, but I had to, I had to pay for it on the back end cause I didn't grow up wrestling. Yeah, I, I just noticed whenever I go into a wrestler, as soon as they put a collar tie, you automatically know, you can just feel it. <laughs> you're like, you know, you've been wrestling for a while. It's like, holy cow, it's a different, different experience. And so I, again, I'm at the very beginning. I boxed a little bit in college. I mean, I did that for about six months, you know, and I realized that there's a better way to make a living in my, you know, in my opinion, because I was going in there and, and just getting, you know, just my jaw would be knocked silly and I couldn't eat, you know, I was getting headaches and I was like, man, there's, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, that's I, funny coming from a guy who, who who quit medical school to go play rugby, right? Like the, those scrums, those scrums are not exactly the most forgiving places to be. You know, it's kind of funny. I remember I was when I when I landed in New Zealand. I mean, I, I one of the guys was was you know poised me on the New Zealand all black team he told me i was you know there's this thing called a scrum and everybody's locked up with their arms you know you're bound up eight guys on the side and he said hey slip your binding and punch the guy in the, in the front row in the face he's telling me to do that i was like what so i said okay so i had to do that smack him in the face you know you hear him cussing the referee's looking around but he you know he would there's just the way yeah. they do it this kind of dirty stuff over there and but yeah there's a lot of that stuff going on so i mean and, and they were teaching you how like remember when i got there they were showing me the cleats and how they fit perfectly uh in the ear canal, you know, you can just fit a uh, right there and you can kind of pull somebody's ear off with that. And so this is a, also a violent, a violent sport, which I, which I was very, for. I never got injured. I was really, I mean, I, you know, I'd like, I'd broken my nose, but nothing like no major injuries, no limb injuries, which is good. I don't know what, not, I don't know if you get through your career without any major injuries, but uh, I've been very kind of lucky. So I've had my fair share. I've had uh, like major injuries. I've had a broken arm, um, Plenty of broken fingers, broke broke uh, my second metacarpal on my left hand in a fight. I've had two meniscus surgeries on my right knee, which is probably the 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 most um, like the pain that sticks like the thing that sticks with me the most because that meniscus injury, which you know I me, mean, you're an orthopedic surgeon. Like it, getting the operation is not that bad. You can be back on a bicycle and w moving within days. Um, but then the long term effect of that is that you don't have any padding between the joint. And then I had a, a 270 degree labrum tear in my right shoulder. But my shoulder is amazing. My, like my my quote unquote bad shoulder feels better than my good shoulder. And so, oh, I'm I'm my body considering what I put my body through because I had a 15 year run total in professional mixed martial arts. And so for that long of a career, and I still unfortunately slash unfortunately treat my body like, like I'm competing, you know, I go in the gym and I train like a madman with intensity and, and uh, you know, the days that I roll and, and yeah, so I'm still kind of putting my body through the ringer, but no, I mean, I have days where I wake up and I'm a little stiff and I might have trouble, trouble tying my shoes, but all in all, I'm, I'm in, I'm in pretty good shape given the, the wear and tear I put on myself. Yeah, no, I think, but I mean, honestly, Rich, I mean, you know, I, I'm, you know, I've got a little bit of years on you, but I mean, you just got to keep doing that. I mean, honestly, you know, you just keep training hard. It may be different sports and different, different pursuits, but I mean, once you lose that, you know, you're kind of done in my view. And so I've kind of kept that, you know, for, for 40 years now. And I don't, you know, I'm, I'm sure if I make it to 90, I'm going to be in there trying to compete in something as a 90 year old, whatever it may be, maybe there'll be, yeah. uh, maybe, you, maybe, maybe you can be an Olympic curling athlete or something at that point in time. <laughs> you know, there's, there's always some, I, I was on a plane one time with a guy who was, he, this guy was 92 years old sitting next to me and I was flying back just a domestic flight here in the U S and I said something to him. I said, you know, it was like, are you out, out in business or pleasure? And he's like, Oh, I'm, I'm working. And I looked at him, I'm like working. I'm like, how old are you? He said 92. I said, are you ever going to retire? And he just looked at me and said, he said, son, when you rest, you rust. And that's just stuck with me ever since. And that's something that'll stay with me till the time that I die, man. Because, you know, the moment that you, what happens, like after I retired, there was a bit of a time where I wasn't grappling as much. And then I could feel my body getting stiffer. Like it wasn't, that's why I was asking you about dexterity, because the sport forces your body to move in ways that you don't, 
normally move. Even if you're a, like, even being say, for example, a CrossFit athlete, you have to have a certain dexterity for that sport. But the moment you do something like BJJ, it's a different kind of dexterity. And that's why I was wondering like, and has your body been adapting to it? You, you know, has there been any differences over this five month period? There's things I still have to have to sort of get at, you know, there's different games, obviously every different body type is going to have a different game. And so I'm going to be a little different than someone who's smaller and more agile. You know, I tend to use a, you know, a lot of pressure and that stuff. And, you know, the guys are doing the inversion stuff. I'm like, I don't know how much I'm going to do of that stuff right now, but maybe, maybe later on and so far, but I mean, I haven't, there, there really hasn't been too many things I haven't been able to do as far as, you know, like this particular situation, I've been able to generally do that. It's usually figuring out the mental cue, though that, that one thing that allows you to, to, to perform, you know, like learning, like I was learning, you know, just a, just a simple, you know, uh, seated mount. I was like, I'm having trouble getting my foot in. And then I was like, you got to lean a certain way before you can swing it in there. And, 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 you know, that, that type of stuff. But yeah, I, I mean, I'm pretty flexible. I mean, I can, easily stand up, touch my toes. I've got full range of motion, my hips, my shoulders, and very good. It's very nice. Like, cause I, you know, as a white belt, you get, you know, in submissions all the time. And I, I can, I'm pretty flexible. I don't tap for a long, long, long time. And cause I've got these long limbs, a lot of people that are just like, or to pull that, I try to finish out to, to, to fully tap that out. So that's been, been in my favor, but yeah, I've been really, really fortunate that, that, uh, um, you know, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll point to, you know, I think I know that part of this conversation is towards you know, nutrition and I think nutrition plays a role on joint health. You know, I saw it as an orthopedic surgeon particularly, and I think, you know, a, a poor diet leads to poor tissue quality and then it leads to more injury. I'll ask you this question first. We'll go, go down this rabbit hole. I have, man, I have so many questions for you. Let me, t I'll tell you this. So your, your book, I, the book is intriguing and it's kind of counterintuitive to everything I've ever learned about nutrition, obviously. I mean, you know this when you wrote the book, cause you're like, hey, man, a lot of people. And then I had a buddy who decided to do a carnivore diet, a good friend of mine, uh, about a year ago. And he's like, well, I'm going to do this for 30 days. And then 30 days went by, then he decided he was going to do it 90 days. And after 90 days, and he's still doing this, he's been doing it for about a year. And so after 90 days, like he, he the, his girlfriend uh, was a doctor and she's like, look, you shouldn't be doing this. It's not good for you. But then as time went on, like he's getting his blood markers checked, everything's moving the way that it should be. He's losing weight, maintaining muscle mass. And, and I'm sitting here scratching my head. I'm like, man, this just doesn't, doesn't make sense to me that you're not eating any vegetables. So um, I, I actually checked, I, I picked up your book. I was like, you know, I want to read this book. And then I, I checked back in with him the other day. I said, Hey, are you still carnivore? And he said, yeah, I am. And I chatted with him about it the other day. So I was like, man, I got, I, I definitely wanted to pick your brain about this because I just like, I like making myself think outside of my box constantly, uh, to, to challenge my thought process. And so I was like, well, I think I'm actually going to give this thing, uh, use myself as a guinea pig and give it a go and see, see what it's like. But I wanted to, uh, pick your brain about it. So th the first thing is like, how, how do you, how do your energy levels do? I know that as CrossFit athlete, you kind of use the same energy levels that you would grappling, but how do your energy levels do when you're performing? I mean, as far as like jujitsu, I mean, and I guess that's, you know, cause some people say, well, how do you do in this sport? And how do you do that sport? Obviously I've been very strong. I, you know, I set world records on, on the concept to rowing machine as a carnivore athlete. You know, I, I don't know if you ever use it. I, I had a, a 114, 500 meter row, which is you know, in line with a lot of, a lot of 20 year old athletes doing that. So as a 50 year old. Yeah, so, no, I, I actually, I read that the best I've ever done on a 500 meter row is 124. And so me and my buddy were talking, I was talking about it the other day. Cause I had called him. I said, yeah, I said, I'm going to be talking to uh, Dr. Baker. And he's like, oh man, I wish I could sit in on that session. And, um, and, and he said, yeah, he goes, hey, we were talking because yeah, he, he has some world records. And I said, yeah, he's a couple book record on the rower. And he said, what's the best you've ever done on the rower? I said, 500 meters, 124. And I said, and doing that, I said, I thought I was about to die after, after that 124, like that, that was, uh, that was it. So, um, so yeah, like, uh, 114 is just hauling. It's crazy insane. Yeah. But I mean, as far as jujitsu is concerned, I mean, you know, like I said, once I got the point of figuring out when to breathe and when to relax, you know, the conditioning has not been a problem. Like, you know, like I said, I was this weekend, we did, I think I, I rolled like, I don't know, 14 rounds, you know, continuously, you know, I, and, and I was fine. I wasn't tired from that. I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't winning all the time, but I wasn't, it, I wasn't limited by my, my, my conditioning anyway. But again, I've been doing this for half years on this diet, you know, and so I've kind of adapted to it. And what I see with certain athletes and, you know, some people adapt to it, like, and they have no problem at all. But I mean, there, there are definitely people that, uh, you know, have, uh, have issues with energy. And some of it has to do with, you know, because, you know, meat tends to be very satiating, and they tend to under eat, they tend not to take enough calories, sometimes they're elect they get behind on their electrolytes and fluids, those things are issues. And some people, it just takes three or four weeks just to adapt. And so some people, you know, they go in there, they'll do it for a week. And they're like, man, I, you know, my performance is down. 
screw this, I'm done. And so you see that, uh, you know, when I talk to people, like, like I get a lot of like, I've had a lot of like professional fighters that have kind of talked to me about this stuff. And a lot of times what they do is they just kind of just kind of dial down the carbohydrate to a minimum effective dose. You know, one of the things that I've seen, you know, particularly with regard to recovery, you know, you think about what's going on when you're recovering, you know, we generally every day about one to 2% of our muscle mass is turning over and so we've got this you know protein turnover uh we have this sort of oxidative stress we're dealing with so all this stuff we're doing throughout the day you know eating sleeping exercise just breathing is creating this oxidative stress when you go without the carbohydrates there's just less of that you know we just know metabolically there's a little bit less oxidative stress and so at the end of the day when you when you're providing yourself with this high quality nutrition you know and i think red meat particularly is just tremendous it's a superfood um, you think about it, you know, we're all, you know, human beings are basically red meat animals. I mean, I've, you know, I've cut and open and I know I mean, I've seen that. And so when, we, when we're re rebuilding animal cellular structure, you know, the materials, the building materials we need for that are basically the same materials that we're consuming when we're eating, you know, meat based diet. And so the other stuff is less efficient. It's not that you can't get protein or you can't get, you know, certain, you know, uh, nutrients from these plant sources. It's just less efficient. You know, if we look at uh, nutrition strategies through, across species throughout the world, you know, since the, the dawn of time of all the species that ever existed, you know, something like 85% of them have been, been carnivorous. You know, this is, a, this is, a, this is the, you know, if you look at every little species that's ever existed, now there are a lot of herbivores because there's just, uh, you know, there's a, there's a good environment for that. But I mean, as far as efficiency of nutrition, you know, a meat-based diet tends to do that. And it's not that, uh, you know, you can't have plants or you can't have a plant-based diet, or even the humans were not doing that. I'm not, you know, if you read my book, I clearly say humans are realistic omnivores. However, I think we, we function very well on a high meat diet. And you, you can find out where your, uh, you know, where your, where your range is. You know, some people just hundred percent, they love it. Some people are 90%, some people are 80%. Once you do it, and particularly if you get a good response from this, which I think many people do, it really changes your perspective. And, and now instead of looking at meat as something you can only have, you know, as a World Economic Forum to tell as an occasional treat while we own nothing, that you're a component of your daily nutrition. And, you know, you're going to want to, you know, you're going to want to maximize that. And then the other stuff becomes, you know, just kind of the, uh, variety or flavoring and things like that. And that's kind of how, I, you know, I approach it with most people. Um, Just going back to, uh, cause I don't want to drift too far away from, but when you talk about like certain performance athletes, some people notice that they need some carbohydrates because when you're on an all meat diet, like you're going to hit this, this mode of ketogenesis where your body really efficiently uses fat as energy. But if you start reintroducing carbohydrates back in your system, wouldn't that kind of confuse the body systems into not, as efficiently using the fat for energy or is there like a tipping point where if you take in too many carbs in the day you understand what i'm trying to trying to ask there you know our bodies use everything all the time i mean we are constantly you know at night we're using ketones we're using free fatty acids we're using you know we're using glucose i mean we're always burning this blend of fuel regardless of your diet now it's going to shift around and you never get like completely inefficient at, at using some more you can't use it now what you see is um, there's a there's a sort of an, an order by which you're going to want to use certain things. Glucose is going to be preferable to fat in many cases. Ethanol is going to be, you know, if you're drinking, you're going to burn that first. And, you know, hopefully nobody's using you know, alcohol as your <laughs> nutrition source. But I mean, the short answer is, yes, you're going to prefer preference glucose over fat. Um, if you if you eat chronically a high amount of carbohydrates, but, you, you, you know, it, it can be for some people, it can be. A significant amount, you know, or some people are eating 100, 150 grams a day, which is a significant amount of carbohydrate. And again, it depends on who you are and how hard you're training and, and, you know, you know, what kind of athlete you are. Whereas some people, I mean, if they eat any, they're really, they're really struggling. And again, I, as a physician, I deal with a lot of non-athletes. And so as much as I think it's cool for athletes and, and you know, and I think that's a great thing. And I think strength training is important and all the, the exercise part, but I'm dealing so much with disease, you know, and that, that's where my focus has been because there's a lot of ways to get lean, as you know, all kinds of athletes have different, different strategies or how they perform better and how they get lean. This is one mechanism I find, you know, in my view, the biggest advantage for a carnivore diet for an athlete is not, you know, directly related to performance, but it's more so related to, um, I think, recovery. And I think, you know, like when you're training for a fight race, you know, you're spending, what, 
you know, six months, maybe four to six months, you know, training for a fight. That entire yep. time you have to perform every single day. You know, there's some days where you're going to feel like garbage and your training's not going to be as good. And so what I think in that context, a carnivore diet or, or not as close to carnivore allows you to feel better. But I think when we look at what goes into performance, you know, it's just not how fast you can crank the crank on, on an ergometer. Yeah. You know, it's something like, you know, what is my mental state of health mentally? Do I feel good? Do I feel, do I feel up? You know, do I feel confident? Um, what is my recovery like? What is my sleep like? All these things play a role. And, and those things, in my view or in my experience, you know, when you dial in nutrition, particularly with a carnivore diet, those things tend to get better. And so you might be able to say, hey, look, I know that I can spin, you know, I can do a, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, a bike test, sprint test, and I can get 3% more speed out if I, if I carb load. But you know, if you look at that over, over a period of six months where you're like, well, I did that one day, but the next day I felt sore and my knees started hurting or I didn't get as much sleep or on and on and on, those things add up over time. And so where I find that uh, a lot of guys just feel better, particularly, and again, this may have a role in, in older guys. You know, like I said, I'm in my fifth, I didn't start doing the car, but I told you before I turned 50. And, you know, for me, it was like night and day. I was like, holy cow, you know, all this crap that I've been dealing with, all this aches and pains that I had, which I thought were just part of aging and part of what I was going to experience the rest of my life. And I was going to progressively slow down. It's like everybody else that I see does, it just went away. And I was like, this is pretty freaking cool. So then I was like, okay, I'm going to start training. And my training in my fifties went like what it was in my thirties. And that's, that's been a huge advantage for me. And so it may be that, you know, certain fighters, maybe, you know, guys towards the end of their career or guys that want to, you know, that, that are in the, you know, in their early thirties and they're looking like, you know, for, you know, as a, as a fight athlete and you and you start getting in your thirties for many people, you're kind of running yeah. out of steam. I mean, there, obviously there's guys in their forties still going, but, but for many people, they're like, they're feeling pretty beat up. They've taken some injuries, you know, their shoulder always hurt, their knee always hurt, whatever it is. And this has been something that kind of rejuvenates a lot of people. And so it's something that, uh, be interesting to see more people do it. I don't know who your, you know, again, I don't know who your friend is. If he's a, if he's a, yeah, oh yeah athlete or if he's just a you know guy that can yeah no he's uh he, he does bjj black belt and judo and um yeah and constantly lifting similar to to what i do so similar kind of lifestyle because uh, yeah i mean basically what you're talking about is just stress management on the body and inflammation and how inflammation just tends to build up and you spent quite a bit of time talking about that in your book which to me was count like it's obviously counter intuitive or opposite of what we've been told because i've always like i started juicing and blending vegetables in my mid thirties, using a lot of things like ginger and turmeric to fight inflammation, which seemed to help, but st still nonetheless, there's this progressive nature of the body kind of, I'll say declining as you get older, so to speak. Um, but I completely agree with you. If you carb load, you're going to be able to outperform one day, but whether or not that over time, essentially the, the, you know, being able to mitigate the stress of those foods over time, whether or not you could do that. So, um, well, let me, so let me ask you then when, when you're training, because, well, let me back out of this for a second, because a lot of, a lot of my listeners aren't going to be just people that are, they're training, fight training, or maybe they're, you know, this becomes a bit of a niche audience. And your, your book actually spends a lot of time talking about like weight loss for the average person, because you, you obviously, when people move to a carnivore type of diet or a, a keto diet or, you know, whatever category you fall under, you, you tend to find that people will lose weight. So, but as I was listening to some of the success stories in the book and how all this, this breaks down and how it works in the body, I was thinking, I don't know if I would be able to keep my weight on. So question to you is that how is it that you maintain body mass with this? Because as I was reading this, I thought, man, if I switch to a carnivore diet, I'm not sure that I could maintain my mass. That's kind of like maintenance mode for me and i don't have i don't have any problem doing that at all i mean i've always been a big eater i mean back when i was 300 pounds i was eating you know nine ten thousand calories a day so i've always had it but i do get guys that struggle i mean they get ripped they get lean you know every, all the fat falls off them and do they'll lose 10 20 pounds and like i didn't have 10 pounds to lose you know and, and so what they have to do is because you know, what naturally happens, you know right now if you look at society in general we're a constantly eating society we've got the snack food industry telling us you got to eat, you know, every, every 30 minutes, it seems. And we eat literally constantly for 16 hours a day. And when you go on a carnivore diet, your appetite just gets blunted so much that you're like, I only want to eat like twice a day. And that's typically what I do. You know, I, I'll usually have two meals a day. Um, and so it's, you very quickly find that you just eat less calories. You know, the, the, you know, the, the topic of weight loss, it, 
you know, if you read my book, I, I, I said, I, this is one I don't really like to talk about because everybody argues about why people are losing weight. And, you know, I'm saying, well, higher protein, we know is an advantage. We know that, you know, satiety helps and, and those types of things and whether or not carbs or fat differentially play a role, that's still very much debatable. But for the guys that like, I want to put on weight, I'm like, you got to eat like four or five meals a day. You know, this, this is what I tell them to do. I mean, you might have to, instead of eating like, like if I'm going to eat two, two pound meals, that's, I can do that. But if I wanted to eat five or six pounds a day, I would want, I would have to eat, you know, three meals a day. And I might have to eat, you know, four different meals to four, one and a half pound meals to do that. So a lot of times people will find that just adding uh, those additional meals and even when they're not hungry is what you have to do. I mean, cause you'll, you'll see it. I mean, if you, if you, if you start doing start a diet and you're like, holy cow, I just dropped five pounds and you're just eating whatever a normal amount, you've got to figure out how to add that back on it. Maybe you're eating past the time oh, yeah. when you don't want to. I think a meat-based diet is kind of a natural human diet for the large part. I don't know, like I said, I'm not saying 100% carnivore diet, but I think meat was a, was a significant part of that. And you see what like a, like a wild human looks like. You see some of these uh, indigenous tribes that are, that are meat heavy, whether they're the polar or, you know, Maasai warriors or something like that. They're not huge. I mean, they're lean, they're muscular, but they're not just giant jack yeah. people. And I think that's abnormal physiology, quite honestly. And to do that, you've got to be, I mean, number one, you got to do the resistance training. You got to be, you know, obviously you got to be doing the, the weightlifting and the, and the strength training. You got to do that consistently, but you have to eat probably beyond what your appetite normally would, would regulate you at. And, you know, and it's great for people who want to lose weight, right? Because it's like, you know, I don't have to think about things. I'm not always hungry. I'm not dealing with that. But if you're trying to pack on muscle, that's why carbohydrates help people put on muscle is because it simulates your appetite. Carbohydrate yeah. tends to have a satiety blunting effect for many people and it allows you to eat more. And, you know, particularly, you know, and I don't want to just pick on, and I'm not anti-carbohydrate. I, you know, I, people are surprised when I say that. I think you know, we need glucose and for many people, carbohydrates are, are, are effective. My my concern with, with particularly with the carnivore diet has been always about health. I mean, I see these autoimmune conditions and mental health issues and other things getting better. And that's, you know, that's one of the reasons we founded the company we founded. But as far as, you know, um, you know, putting on muscle, yes, you, you can, you can use carbohydrates to stimulate appetite. You can use it for performance with glycogen. Uh, we know that muscle building, you know, the, 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 the blueprint for building muscle is adequate protein and resistance training. There's no need for carbohydrate to build muscle. I mean, the literature is pretty clear on that. Now, does uh, carbohydrate have a role in perhaps limiting breakdown of muscle? Perhaps does it have a performance advantage? Uh, for sure. I mean, there's there's definite definite performance advantages in that. Um, but is it is it you know is it possible to build muscle on a strictly carnivorous diet? Absolutely, you can. And I know many people that do it very well and very effectively. As I was reading your book the whole time, I thought, man, if I switched over to a carnivore diet, like, because I'm going to, I'm going to give this a try. I don't really count my calories, but I have before pretty, pretty rigorously and weighed and measured my food and used food scales, especially when I was making weight at 185 competing, you know, then, because I had to, like, I had to be very specific about myself, but like, Right now, I, I probably take in mm, about 350 grams, 350 to 400 grams of, of protein a day. And, and you know, obvi so obviously quite a bit of meat as is already, but overall I'm eating uh, about 42 to 4,400 calories. So then I'm typically on maybe something like a 40% carbohydrate, 30% protein 30 percent fat kind of split and so i'm just i'm thinking like well i mean gram for gram there's a lot i'll have to take in a lot less fat to make up if i was just to completely replace all those carbs with the fat then that's fine but i'm like i'm looking at how that's going to obviously you know if you're going to four or five pounds of meat a day I mean, how, do you track how many grams of protein that you're taking in or does any of that matter matter to you i know you don't weigh your food but do you kind of i mean because obviously like gaining weight and losing weight it boils down to calories in calories out you know the, the simple math of that i mean it there is truth to that not all calories are, are equal obviously but and you talk quite a bit about processed foods and convenience foods in your book but you know you do if you want to gain if you want to be in an anabolic state you have to obviously being a caloric surplus in order to put on weight. Yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, because what I eat is basically the same thing all the time. The macronutrient composition doesn't vary that much. You know, maybe I'll eat a ribeye versus sirloin. It'll be a little bit higher, higher and lower fat content, but generally 
for me to gain weight, I just got to eat more food. And for me to lose weight, it's the same thing. You know, I can play with, you know, maybe going higher protein and eat a little leaner cuts of meat if I want to get leaned out, which I'm something I'm doing actually right now. I'm eating more sirloin steaks. But I mean, for for your, I mean, 30% protein is actually, I think, a pretty nice place to be. I mean, that's that's far, that's double what the average American gets. The average American's only eating about 15% of their calories from protein. So I think we eat a woefully inadequate amount of protein for uh, you know, for the population, you know, and th- these are the population recommendations, which are inadequate in my view. They, they are enough to keep you barely alive. But if you want to thrive and be an athlete and maintain lean muscle mass, which is so incredibly important, I mean, get a, getting that higher amount of protein, I think is vital. And I think 30%, you know, so if you're on a carnivore diet, you know, 30% of your 30% protein would look like something like ribeye steaks. I mean, that's, that's about a 30% protein, 7% fat. We show. So you might, you know, you might do some combination of steak and then throw some eggs in there you know like you know maybe you're eating three and a half pounds of steaks and a dozen eggs or something like that that would probably get you somewhere in that caloric range and then you just have to kind of see where you're at and see like what's my appetite like what's my weight doing and then you just you just make the obvious adjustment from there if i'm losing weight and i don't want to lose weight i gotta eat more if i'm you know if i'm not losing weight and i want to lose weight you're gonna eat a little bit less but once you kind of adapt to that you know, that, that sort of macronutrient and food composition uh, over a period of a couple of weeks, then it just becomes a matter of just moving it up and down. And you're right, calories out and calories in. The part, the hard part is the calories out because, you know, we can we can kind of measure and track what we're bringing into our body. And, you know, sometimes we're off in our estimates a little bit. We're generally got a pretty good idea, but the calories out part kind of gets changed. You know, there's like, I mean, even the temperature can change your calories out. You know, when it's hot outside, you don't have to create as much body heat, Right. So this is this is why uh, the polar populations like the Eskimos would, would routine, and either these are tiny people. These are people that were 130 pounds, or males were like five foot three, 130 pounds, and they were putting down four to eight pounds of meat a day because it's so damn cold, and they got to generate all this body heat. And so you know things like you know things change all the time. You know, and again, obviously, you know, your training one day is going to be you're going to put more out than other days. You know, one days, you know, there's days where you're going to have stress, there's days when you're going to have a cold, and all those things are going to impact this. So it kind of becomes kind of intuitive and so when you sort of when people ask me to tell me how many calories should I eat and how much protein I'm kind of like you know I can't be a ballpark but I'm not going to say you know exactly this or that and you you kind of um one of the things is you you know you kind of get better at listening to your body and you know there'll be times when fat just doesn't seem very appealing you know you're like I just you know that's too much fat right now and I don't need that and there's other times when you know you just like give me all the friggin' ribeye steaks I can eat and, and you know your body will kind of catch up with that one of the things you know I've got a, a good friend of mine uh, he's fighting in Bellator next week and it, I, I don't know what number is it 274 or something like that he's, he's fighting as a 155 and he's been doing he's 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 had I think four fights as a carnivore now I think he's won three and lost one of them uh, but he's fighting and he's he he says the weight cut he has on carnivore has been the easiest weight cut he's ever done in his life uh, I it did just it's not a struggle it's not it's not a problem it's very easy to do um, and I've, I've talked to a lot of like fitness competitors and people that do like, you know, competitive, you know, getting shredded for whatever aesthetic sports, so they said the same thing, you know, because, you know, you're maintaining that fat level to where your hormones don't tank on you. Cause a lot of times people, you'll see it, they'll run their, you know, they'll, they'll run the low fat so long that they just, their hormones tank and they feel like garbage and their gut gets messed up. You know, if they're trying to show all this fiber in their diet and it just plays, plays, wreaks havoc on their intestinal health and, so it's a, so it's an issue, but this is, this is something that I think works pretty well for, for, yeah, when I, when I was cutting weight, uh, I would typically cut like my cuts. I would, I would walk around mm, in fight camp, maybe 207, 208 by the time I was ready to begin my weight cut. And, and now my process would start about three weeks out, but for like the last week we would completely cut out all starches, all carbs, uh, for, for that week and for that purpose. And, and a lot of bodybuilders, obviously in that industry as well. Yeah. Because for, for me on my nutrition, when I'm not obviously cutting for a match or something like that, when I'm, when I'm just regular out of season training, like right now, in order for me to maintain mass, cause I don't have a real big frame. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm sitting at about 225 right now. And for me to maintain that I am eating six times a day and, you know, taking in, Roughly, uh, I don't know, f- f- you know, fifty between fifty and sixty grams of carbohydrates, at pretty much every meal. But 
you, you know, I mean, there's the, the, these other things that I've been taught, like in nutrition, like is your body have the ability to assimilate more nutrition, more protein than 50 or 60 grams? Because, you know, we've always been told like you read in any bodybuilding magazine, like you can only take in so many grams of protein for your body weight at a given sitting. And so it has to be spaced out. So I'm that six meals a day kind of guy. I'm the guy that eats beyond satiety. I do take in protein shakes because having like a liquid meal a day sometimes is a convenience factor if I'm on the move or other times it's easy for me to get in that 700, 800 calorie bump when I otherwise would have to sit and eat that food. Uh, you, you know, so uh, you, cause you, you don't, you're, you don't use supplements personally, do you? Um, you know, I, I guess the, the thought is, you know, and, and you know, I'm very well familiar with the literature talking about, you know, protein per meal. And I've talked to a lot of the researchers, you know, some of the top guys, Stu Phillips and uh, guys like Don Lehman and, uh, Jose Antonio, any of those, those guys, most of that data is, is derived from, uh, you know, protein shakes. I mean, most of it, because the studies are funded and they don't, they're not feeding people steaks. And when you eat a steak, you know, the, the rate of absorption slowed down tremendously. And so you see like, you know, you think about it, if human beings could not utilize more than 30 or 40 grams of protein in setting, I mean, evolutionarily, I don't know how we made it because if you think in all that nutrition is wasted, you know, where would we get the, the 30 grams every six hours? I mean, we didn't walk around as cavemen with Tupperware containers, you know, every three hours and stop and have a little protein snack. I think we just had these big meals. And what we see is the justice system is very good at when you, when you, when you throw down a, you know, a, a, you know, a 24 ounce porterhouse steak, you know, it doesn't just take the first 30 grams and then the next 80 or hundred and well, whatever's in there, you know, 150 grams and just throw it out. It's slowly digested. You know, it takes four hours to gastric emptying time, the transit time for the intestines, maybe 12, 16, 18 hours. And so that entire time, those amino acids are being sort of put into the into the circulation. And so it's a different sort of, uh, you know, kinetic for that. Now, is it optimal? Probably not. You know, again, like I said, I don't think I don't think cavemen were giant bodybuilders. Like I said, when you're when you're trying to optimize for muscle protein synthesis, then yeah, probably taking in a rapidly digested, you know, 30, 40 grams of protein every four hours is probably going to be the optimal way to do this. But to say that you're wasting all that, that protein is, I think, also not, not accurate. You know, we, we, we pretty much know that's not true. Um, we see that, uh, you know, for instance, when we, uh, you, you know, when we uh, consume protein with fat, the digestion is slow down tremendously. And again, we're designed to eat these, you know, there's some good studies out there looking at, you um, uh, whole foods, like there's a study out of uh, Duke University, Stephen Van Bleet did this one a couple of years back, whole egg versus egg white, which one which one provided more muscle protein. This is I did, even though the, the protein was equated because I think the cholesterol uh, was, was was driving, you know, the anabolism, you know, and the same thing with whole milk versus, you know, skim milk. And so we're seeing these things have a role outside of uh, just protein absorption. And, you know, again, when they talk about 30 or 40 grams of protein, and again, that's on an average size human. You got somebody who's 250 pounds versus somebody who's 100 pounds. There's going to be different numbers, obviously. But talk, we're, we're again talking about protein powders for the most part. And, and again, these are studies that maybe don't, don't apply to somebody eating a whole food diet. You know, it's like if I if I could only if I only eat twice a day, right? And I'm eating you know 400 grams of protein, which I routinely do. And I can only absorb 30 percenting, then that means I'd only taken 60 grams of protein a day. I would literally be withering yeah. away to nothing. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense. And I'm not. So obviously I'm able to, to use all utilize some of that, right? What what is your overall caloric intake in a day? Do you know? 35 calories on a heavy day, five thousand. If I'm trying to gain weight, I might eat six thousand calories a day. You know, it just depends. Uh, obviously training is going to impact that a little bit. I get hungry as, as, as you might imagine, if I train real hard, I get hungrier and when yeah. I get hungrier, I eat yeah. more, you know, it's just kind of one of this common sense type of things, but, but, you know, I'd say at sitting at rest much, um, I mean, you know, kind of baseline level of activity. I, I'm, I'm active every day. I do something every, like right before we got, we did this, I went for a couple mile hike with a 50 pound vest, but I mean, I, you know, I'm always doing something every day, but some days are harder than others is, you know, I'm sure, you know, some days are really, you know, days where you really kill it and other days you just kind of maintain that stuff. But 4,000 baseline, which is, you know, pretty, I mean, if you look at the, the, the sort of the, you know, the, uh, 
the calculators for metabolism, you know, that for, for a guy who's my size and weight and activity level, that's about, about what I'm projected to need somewhere around 4,000, 4,000 calories a day. So I'm, I'm pretty close to that. And I'm pretty, pretty and weight stable. With, with your 4,000 calories a day, do you, do you personally eat any carbs at all? Or are you just straight 100% meat? 98% of the time, it's pretty much steak and eggs. I mean, like, you know, today I had a, what I have for a couple of sirloin steaks for breakfast. And then I had about a half dozen eggs and I'll have something similar later today. You know, sometimes I have some dairy, which will have a little bit of carbohydrate. I guess to be fair, eggs have a little bit of carbohydrate in there, about a half a gram per egg, you know, some, nothing significant. Every once in a while, you know, I'll, I'll eat a piece of fruit. Every and very, like My kid will have a birthday. I'll have a piece of birthday cake. But I mean, for the most part, 98% of my time is pretty much straight up, you know, whatever carbohydrate I get incidentally in meat, which is essentially none. Do you switch like chicken, chicken thighs, fish, salmon, anything like that? Or you pretty much stick to red meat? Yeah, every once in a while. But I, I'd say, I was just thinking about in the last five years, I probably had about 3,000 steaks. I mean, I'm not without exaggerating. I mean, I eat steak every single day, often twice a day. Uh, I can think of maybe 10 times in the last five years where I, did, where I did not eat red meat on a day. And some of those days I didn't eat at all. You know, like I was traveling on a plane, I didn't feel like eating. But um, but there are times I'll go out and, you know, I'm, I live now in the Pacific Northwest and so there's a lot of seafood up here. So I'll go up and get some, you know, shellfish and shrimp, some salmon, stuff like that. Um, but it, but it's really a small part of my diet. I don't really feel a need to add it in there. I, I honestly feel that I get so much nutrition out of red meat that, that I'm not lacking for, I don't need organ meats. This is another thing that people sort of, sort of that you must to make a car. Well, that's not what the data shows. I and mean, I've got data on 12,000 people that have done this diet. Organ meats make basically no, no difference in outcomes, even though I know there's people that swear by them and you know they, they wanna, tell you that you have to do that but that's that's just not what the data shows and the harvard university study on 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 carbon diet says the same thing they had two thousand people and i specifically asked the researchers hey would you please ask about organ meats and they saw again no difference in outcomes and so uh, you can sit there literally and eat ground beef every day for and I, I know people eat ground beef and bacon every day for three or four years and they're great they're doing fine they've got no deficiencies their lab numbers look great they're happy as can be they're they're sane and so it's something that really kind of you know it's something that a lot of people fancy because you're like what do you you know if you don't eat this perfect blend of nose to tail grass finished animal that you're somehow going to have this problem that's just not the case i mean I, you know i like that message i, I that message resonates with me and, I, and from an environmental standpoint from an ethical standpoint I, I always promote you know buy from your local ranchers you know uh, I think the regeneratively raised animals are better for the environment in many ways. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I imagine a lot of the people listening to this are going to be thinking like, hold on, wait a minute. What about fiber and the plants? I know you covered this in your book, but what about like plant fiber and, and uh, vitamins and minerals? You can't get all that from the meat. This is crazy. Like this is absurd to, you know, the average kid. Look, I grew up in the eighties, right? Uh, we had, we had the four food groups and then they decided to switch it up to the, the, the pyramid at one point in time. And, uh, you know, we had people like Arnold Schwarzenegger telling us to eat all our vegetables. So like, this is crazy. This is your, this is crazy talk, doc. Like, come on, man. This is crazy talk. This is crazy to you and I today. And, and when I first heard about people eating all meat, I said, you guys are friggin' nuts. You know, I, I thought the same, same thing. And then I started looking into it looking into the so the rationale, but you know, if you go around the world, you know, even today, and then certainly historically, there've been populations that thrive without any significant amount of vegetation in their diet. And you circumpolar populations, you know, the Inuit, the Sami, the Nene, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the hundreds of tribes that live around the polar regions. You've got the Nilotic African tribes, all these that, that have lived basically, you know, uh, with minimal to no vegetation. The Mongolians, you know, back, you know, in ancient Mongolia, the time of Genghis Khan. Oh, they still do. I've been to Mongolia. That's what, they eat just milk and meat. That's it, man. Like you, you go there, occasional dough ball, but it's if you don't like meat and milk, don't go to Mongolia. That's all I'm going to tell you. But this is normal in those cultures, and now particularly today, where we have 24/7, 365 days a year access to fruits and vegetables that don't even grow on the same continent. You know, it's like, how would anybody have cobbled that diet? You know, when you look at the, the food recommendations or my plate or whatever it is, it's like most of those foods don't even exist in the same region, let alone the same continent in many, many, many places. And so it's like, how could that have conceivably happened? And, you know, the, the, the thought about fiber, I mean, fiber 
has an advantage in that it is displacing junk food out of the diet and it, it, it mitigates a glucose spike. If you eat an apple versus apple juice, you're going to have less of a glucose rise because of the fiber in there. But to say it's essential in the diet and it is something that you can't live without, you know, I'm living proof it's not. I mean, I, if it was essential, I'd be dead by now, right? And so are the thousands and thousands of other people who have done this and so are the, the, the millions of people throughout have done this. Um, fiber is a mark in many cases, uh, particularly in Western society, of, of affluence. You know, people that can afford organic fruits and vegetables and, and, and a lot of fiber-rich diet tend to be wealthier. Wealthier people tend to have better outcomes. You know, if you're not eating, you know, could you think about potato chips and cookies and candy bars don't have a lot of fiber in them. If, if your diet is basically made up of that, you can throw the McDonald's junk food in there, the French fries, the double cheese, the Coke, your health is going to be bad, you know, compared to somebody that, that cares about them. So I think we see a lot of that, you know, some of the concerns about the gut microbiome, you know, this is still in its infancy. We, we are so far away from understanding the, all the implications and the complexities of the gut microbiome. But one of the things they talk about is, you know, if you eat fiber, there's going to be short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which are, you know, made by these you know, fiber loving bacteria in your gut. And that's true. But we know that, you know, butyrate, for instance, can be generated in many ways. You know, we, we talked a little bit about ketosis. You know, you talked about that earlier in the, in the, in the, in the discussion here. Ketones are, the, the circulating in, in the body is beta-butyric acid, and, or, or, or beta-hydroxybutyrate, rather. And beta-hydroxybutyrate is one OH molecule away from being butyric acid. And it's very, it's an interconvertible reaction. It's very quickly changed. And, and some people think that even the butyrate is actually acting through beta hydroxide, which is the same ketone. And that's why it protects it. So if you're, if you're liberating ketones or diet, you probably don't need to ingest the fiber. And so we're seeing it. Because I mean, I can tell you, you know, if the predictions about lack of fiber and red meat were true, then everybody that goes on a carnivore diet would see all that issues. We're not seeing any of that. We're seeing, in fact, quite the opposite. We're seeing people with IBS where their gut goes away. I'm sure your friend can tell you that his gut health is is very good. You know, I mean, I'm sure he's going to say, I don't bloat. I don't have all these digestive issues uh, since he's been on carnivore. We see people with Crohn's disease. We see people with ulcerative colitis, these very severe gut problems with gastrointestinal, or sorry, GERD, uh, gastroesophageal reflex disease or SIBO or, you know, on and on get carnivore and if, if fiber was essential for that for gut health and why are all these people getting better it doesn't make any sense when i think about eating uh, a carnivore diet i think to myself well let me ask you this question do you ever like when you eat meat do you you uh, sometimes you talk about like mixing meat with cheese is there any uh reluctance on your part to avoid different foods like for example like milk and meat at the same time because the enzymes that are required to break those two things down are different sets of enzymes like that makes digestion more difficult i don't necessarily think there's a lot to, to worry about with regard to that you know i think when um again it depends on the person you're dealing with like i said for most people you know hey beef every day you're not going to do that diet. I wouldn't do that diet. It's boring. It's, you know, it's not, it's not something I'd be interested in. I would, I would last about a week on that diet and I'd be done. And so I, you know, I, when I tell people to switch over the diet, it's, you know, Hey, get a variety, eat meat, eat seafood, eat, you know, eat fish, eat shellfish, eat dairy, you know, eat pork, whatever, mix some dairy in there, throw some cheese on your ground beef or whatever, and see how you do with that for a while. Use some spices if you, if you like this. And then over time, you'll figure out what works for you and what, doesn't but to say that you know you shouldn't mix this and that is it's just not based on you know uh sort of paradigm has been what actually works for people i mean there's all this theoretical stuff you know we we, we theorize that because of a carnivore diet your gut microbiome should have this issue or you're going to be deficient in you know manganese or you're going to have a folate deficiency and then i look at what actually happens to people and and that's what's been my guiding principle it's all results based you know where there's all this theory on what's going on in the body at the end of the day we don't really know i mean we can we, we know some things but we don't it's so much more complicated than than we think we you know you know the more you study these things the more you realize how complicated it is and so at the end of the day it's like what am i doing what are the results and that's all i ultimately sort of care about at the end of the day i mean somebody wants to figure out the mechanisms by which that happened that's great i think good luck it'll probably take the next hundred years to do that but as far as mixing foods, um, you know, I mean, there are some impacts for sure. I mean, every everything has an interaction with everything else. Is it a net negative effect for you? You know, it might be. Most people do fine with that. You know, I mean, 
can I eat a mixed plate of pork and chicken and beef and some cheese and, and maybe some apples in there? Sure, I can do that. And that's not a problem. Um, are there other people who be a problem for? It depends. You know, I get some people that are really, really, really sick. They have really messed up guts. And this is the other thing that I think is kind of cool because, uh, you know, at no point have I said, you know, carnivore diet is you have to do for the rest of your life. I use it as a tool. And this is, again, with our company, Rivero this can be a baseline elimination tool and it fixes a lot of people, you know, it, it you know, for whatever reason, you know, we can, we, there, there's, I can go into why I think it's going on, but it seems to fix people uh, to a point where their gut is kind of healthier, you know, back, cause when you're a kid, I mean, we, a lot of us, you know, we could eat a lot of things and it didn't mess us up. But then as an adult, all of a sudden, well, I can't eat gluten or I can't eat, you know, I can't eat this or that. I can't eat, you know, uh, this vegetable for whatever reason messes me up and that shouldn't be the case i mean if you think you know humans evolved around this sort of variety of food which we clearly did we should be able to tolerate at least much of that and many people can't and i think it's the modern diet that has destroyed you know destroyed our health in a number of ways and i think it starts in our gut what about uh you know organic meat meat that's not treated with hormones antibiotics and then down to the feed that they give the the cattle that you're eating do you care about the the feed being organic like how do all these things play into like for you personally so there's there's a couple of questions that go into that you know for for one you know antibiotics you know in, in the animal agriculture industry they, they certainly use them to some degree they've used them a lot less than they used to I mean, the regulations are pretty tight. You know, you can't slaughter an animal that's been given antibiotics within a three weeks, five weeks, you know, depending on, on where it is. So there's really no appreciable level of antibiotics typically found in, in conventional. I mean, the, the hormone situation, you know, they give, you know, they, they, they do use that for, for some of these cattle. And, you know, you'll see an increase in the amount of hormone that shows up in the meat, but the amount difference is so incredibly small. Like, like a normal cow, like a male cow is going to produce yeah, I'm, not, I'm just for the sake of art, because I can't remember the exact number. Say, say they make seven nanograms of estrogen per, you know, 100 grams of meat, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of meat. Uh, a, cattle that has, a cow that has been implanted with a hormone is going to be seven nanograms, nine or ten. So, you, you know, third, but it's still an infinitesimally small amount. And so there's been a study looking at, for instance, how much meat would you have to eat to to consume the amount of estrogen that you and I as males produce you know we we all you know we produce testosterone as males but we also make estrogen and that number is basically 27 cows you would have to eat 27 entire cows a day to get the same amount of estrogen you normally produce so it's it's it's, it's really this like this so for the purposes of you know human health I, again, I don't see a significant difference in the eyes eating this versus somebody who's eating beef that's been finished, you know, raised on grass and then finished out for two months in a feedlot. I just don't see the, re the results being different. And so I, I tend not to, to, to say it's, it's essential to do one or the other. Some people have, some people finish beef, they think it tastes better. And I can see that it's, you know, it tends to be better marbled. The marbling tends to be higher in monounsaturated fat, which some people would argue is better versus some of these other things, whereas the grain, the grass finished beef has more conjugated linoleic acid and more, you know, higher omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. So there's all these different various thoughts on there. So I, I don't think for human health, it matters but from the environmental standpoint. I think that's where the biggest, best argument you can make, because we know that an animal has been sort of pastured in a certain way where they rotate the cows, they're going to restore the environment. And I think that's where the argument should be made. And if you care about things and you care about the environment, then that would be why I would choose, you know, a regeneratively raised animal versus a feline animal. I wouldn't do it so much for health. Um, I think, I just don't think the data supports that, but I mean, I'm certainly sympathetic to that. And I constantly am talking about regenerative agriculture and bringing these people on. Yeah. I liked, I liked, I'll just call it an argument that you made in your book about how people talk about animal eating animals is bad for the environment, but you talked about like just the shipping and containing and movement of all the vegetation that we get and how it's not indigenous to the regions in which we live, that it has a higher carbon impact on the environment than eating meat. And you made a good case for that for people that would argue from, from that perspective, this is you talking about the carnivore diet. Like to me, because I eat so much meat to begin with, it's like, oh, well, this is easy. This is a no brainer. But then there's just certain things that are so ingrained in me. Like, like the thought of putting bacon in my 
daily or semi daily or even a case, like I'm my head is so like no bacon's not good for you even if even if I was just completely carnivorous not in taking any kind of any kind of carbohydrates like there are these preconceived notions that I I would have to completely undo in myself even though I'm the the kind of person that's open to eating just meat and saying oh, I'll give this a try it's it's difficult to deprogram yourself I mean you know when I first thought I was going on this carnivore diet and eating meat I was like bacon's so good I'm gonna eat it all the time but then after a while you're like you know I don't it surprisingly loses its appeal a little bit. Some people may be shocked by that. And so I, you know, I, I mean, yeah, I'll have it sometimes, but it's certainly a significant part of my diet. I probably, it's probably less than 1% of my diet bacon is. Now there's some people where they include it more, but it, uh, you know, the thoughts around, you know, again, about just go back to the environmental stuff. And we have a tremendous amount of misinformation. And I love that word now, this misinformation around the impact of cattle on the environment. It's not that they have no impact, you know, and, and, you know, when we look at worldwide numbers, you know, they'll, they'll often quote 14% of you know, greenhouse gases are from cattle. And that's basically a life cycle assessment. It's not a direct comparison. The direct emissions are closer to 5%. And then we look at like in the United States, EPA cattle are responsible for about 2% of our greenhouse gas emissions. That's, that's not zero. And we should, you know, again, if we're concerned about that, there's things we can do to mitigate that. And there's a lot of neat things that are being proposed that, that can, can impact that. But 2% is a small cost to pay for, for high quality nutrition. You know, like we all have to eat getting around it. None of us can exist without, without a food system. So, you know, it's going to have some, some sort of impact. And, you know, the, the, to their credit, the ranchers and dairy farmers have done tremendous work over the last 50 years in, in bringing their environmental footprint down significantly, something like 30, 40% of what it was in the 1970s. And, you know, you compare that to most other injuries, other industries where it's gone up rather than gone down. So, um, I, I tend to push back on the environmental stuff. I mean, you know, like the water footprint stuff, they start talking about cows using up all the water. 95% of that water is rainwater, which would have fallen regardless. And so when they're talking about, you know, you're using all these bathtubs of water to eat a hamburger, you know, 95% of that's coming from rainwater. It would have fallen regardless if the cows are, the cows aren't in the field doing rain dances, making it rain more, it just rains. And, you know, that water would have been used one way or the other, whether the cows, you know, ate the grass or not. And then, and then, and then they urinate, they urinate. Out. Anyway, it goes back into the water cycle. So we have this, this really um, prevalent and well-funded narrative to, to sort of push us all onto this, you know, the, you know, the, the, narrative, the narrative is get us on the processed food, more processed food, more synthetic lab-created food. It's patentable and highly, highly profitable. And so this is what we're seeing, these attempts to, uh, you know, demonize, you know, this expensive food. Meat is very expensive to I mean, that's just the bottom line. It's so it's hard to make a profit on that. And so they're squeezing the ranchers and giving them the bottom dollar and they're jacking up the price of the retail side uh, so that they can make the money. But the real money is going to be in the fake meat, in the, in the, in the, you know, the beyond meat, the impossible burger, which fortunately people are seeing for what it is, which is just a bunch of processed garbage, which we don't need, which. Have you, have you had an impossible burger? I have not. I have not. I have not tried one. Have you, have you tried one? I'll be honest with you. Uh, for it not being beef, it's not bad. I was with a friend of mine. I, I was eating, uh, we went to this burger place. They had impossible burgers and s- somebody said, yeah, you, you can't tell the difference. And I said, oh yes, you can. And they said, no, no, I'm telling you, you can't tell the difference. I said, listen, I said, I, I, I grew up in the Midwest of the United States. I like, that's pretty much where Angus beef came from. I'm like, if I cannot decipher between a real beef burger and a fake burger, there's something wrong with me. I'm like, I'll do a blindfolded taste test right now. And uh, so I did two different burgers and well, one burger and one impossible burger. And uh, I took, I took a bite of the first, I said, you know, I'm like blindfolded. I'm like, just give me whichever one you want. And they give me the, a burger. I bite into it. I was like, Oh, this is real beef, hundred percent real beef. No mistake in this. I'm like, I'll bet my house on it. Take a bite of the second one, and still, I mean, it wasn't bad, but I, you know, it was like you can definitely tell. I mean, if you eat beef, you can tell. But, um, but the, you know, the thing with that is what I, it would be interesting if you could do a calorie for calorie analysis on the carbon footprint that a calorie or of beef puts on the environment versus a calorie of Impossible Burger, because there's so much processing that goes into that that I can't imagine, I, re- I truly can't imagine that having a lower carbon footprint than actual beef. If you listen to Impossible Burger CEO, they, they made claims that they've not released any of their actual data and they've not done it on a stable form, but really just as importantly, or in fact, more importantly, when we're comparing food substances, a calorie is not necessarily the best me- measure. We, we need to be talking oh, about nutrition sure. because, you know, if, if, 
if we want to talk about the most calorie um, uh, economical food to produce, it's basically sugar. I mean, sugar is the most on a calorie the calorie basis requires the least amount of resource. And so you could just make the argument, well, we should all be in a sugar diet and, and this is what we should be doing. And we kind of already do in many cases. That's why it's in everything because it's so incredibly cheap to produce both financially and resource wise. But if we start talking about high quality protein, we start talking about leucine and zinc and lysine and you know all these different, you know, choline and carnitine and all these things that are in beef and, you know, Again, I'll, I'll point to uh, Stephen Van Vliet out of Duke University. They, they did an actual comparison study between Impossible Burger and beef, and they looked at it from a nutrition standpoint. And it wasn't just, you know, one of the things I didn't realize until about a year ago, that beef has, has something like 50,000 different nutrients. And it. it's not just, you know, a few amino acid fat and a few vitamins. There's 50,000 compounds in beef. And the Impossible Burger has, you know, an equal amount, thousands of them. There was only about a 10% over. 90% from beef you're not getting from this impossible, you know, patty thing. And so, you know, you're completely, they're, they're not even close to protein, even though they have the same amount of protein and fat and, you know, salt and whatever you might say. That they're so nutritionally different. And, you know, Don Lehman did a really nice study looking at what if the whole United States converted to a plant-based diet. They said, you know, you could probably produce about 20% more calories than plant-based with those 20% calories would come tremendous nutritional deficiencies. You would have everybody lysine deficient, leucine deficient, zinc deficient. You'd have all these nutritional deficiencies that would crop up. And so that, that's what we kind of have now. We have an entire nation of people that are overnourished with regard to calories, but they're undernourished when it comes to high quality nutrients. So we have all these people that are just obese. You know, obesity is a malnutrition problem. It's not, a, it's not a, an undernutrition problem, but it's certainly a malnutrition problem. And so by going plant-based, we would just, we would just increase more of that, you know, most junk food um, is plant-based stuff. Just to be honest, Americans eat something like 70 to 75% of their calories are coming from plant sources right now. Now, over half of that is coming from hyper-processed foods, to be fair. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, eating carrots and broccoli is going to kill people, but most of our diet is, is plant-based and an incredible amount of red meat in this country. I mean, it's how, even though we eat more than many places in the world, the average American only eats something like just over two ounces of beef a day. When you think about that, how much is two ounces of beef? It's, you know, it's a tiny, tiny square like that. I mean, that wouldn't even get me out of bed. And, and you know, I th and you think about it, and they're trying to blame all these ills on eating this tiny amount of red meat, which is just ridiculous when we're looking at, you know, I'm eating two ounces of red meat, but two and a half pounds of processed a day. What do you think's more likely to be the be the be the you know the guilty party here. I mean, it's pretty obvious. When you're uh, when you're on the internet, you love to uh, troll like uh, different Twitter accounts, the vegans, and and uh, is this just because you know every, people that don't know you uh, think that you're just like you just hate veganism or whatever. I'm like, no, I just think that uh, he just likes giving people a hard time because whatever. What, what's uh talk to me about, talk to me about your vegan, like you uh, troll the vegans. Social media is, is, is obviously a kind of a circus for sure, as you know. And a lot of it is, you know, if I put up a study and I, I put up several, I put, you know, studies showing, you know, difference between red meat and chicken and, and cholesterol and, and lipid numbers and triglycerides this morning, you get almost no interaction with that. You get a few people to see that you put up some goofy picture of you eating a steak while some vegans making some wacko vegan dish and you get, you know, a hundred times the amount of traffic there. And so it's just, you know, it's just something to like get the message out there. So you have, you have to, you have to entertain people before you can educate them. You know, it's kind of like, you know, I'm probably selling a fight, you know, like when you guys in the UFC, you got to do all this crap to sell a fight, just to get people interested in what it, you know, when, when the end of the day, all you want to do is get out there and, you know, throw hands. But I mean, it's like, it's kind of similar in that regard. And I don't hate vegans per inch at all. I mean, I, I'm, I think, you know, again, this is the other thing I've been sort of sort of making a stand on is freedom of choice around a lot of things, you know, when it comes to, you know, medical autonomy or nutrition, you know, and I think this is something I don't have anybody out there saying we want to outlaw beans and lentils and broccoli, but there are a number of people out there that are saying we want to outlaw meat or restrict your ability to meat or tax your ability to eat meat you know, demonized or teach your kids that meeting is evil, or we'll call you a rapist or a murderer, 
or you know you should go to hell for eating me i mean this is this is what we come from these wacko vegans and i know most of them don't do that so i just try to push back on that and a lot of the information they put out there demonizing me coming from these vegan medical professionals is very one-sided and so i, I kind of in a humorous way like to push back and say well you know this religion you know sometimes you know it's it's just if you can if it's if it's funny if it's if it's just gets people to think um i'll do that you know and i, I again i i i've never like in real life i've had a sort of a negative encounter with anybody i mean i you know everybody that i've ever seen you know i mean you know somebody comes up on the street and happens to recognize me is, hey you love what you're doing you know shake your hand type stuff but i've never had like an angry vegan come up to me and like scream and yell at me or something like that and i've had i've well, vegans out and out and about they've always been polite and nice to them and uh but yeah social media is obviously is you know the limitations are there um and it's a lot of it's mostly about entertainment but I, you know if, if i thought i could just present studies and present a valid argument or talk like this and as many people would watch i would just do that but unfortunately you know we live in this you know if you're if you're if your caption isn't exciting or the screenshot isn't exciting no one even cares when i drop this podcast maybe i'll uh i'll put some sort of clickbait caption with you like choking a vegan or something like that just just to get people to tune in like i don't know maybe i'll title it vegan hater i don't know whatever whatever i need to do to to, to get people to listen so I, uh, because listen, I, I appreciate, I appreciated reading the book because obviously, you know, I personally take in a lot of, a lot of meat when I eat and I eat a lot of red meat. And prior to this, like I, I read the, like I, I, I just read, I soak up any kind of nutritional information I can and I'm open to everything, everything from blending and juicing to, uh, eat right for your blood type. But I've always been a heavy, a heavy meat eater because I'm an O blood type as well. And, you know, just reading that kind of stuff. So when, when I came across your work, I was like, okay, this is somebody I, I, I want want to pick, I want to pick your brain. I want to know how this works. I want to know how, because my immediate thought was, I would like to give this a try. I think I'm going to end up losing weight if I do. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to mitigate that. I might need to do some sort of, you talked about in your book about a car, like a carbohydrate load for high intensity exercise, maybe before or after. So I don't know, hitting something like some berries or just, you know, a piece of fruit that gives me a quick sugar bump maybe before and after, uh, my workouts. Um, and then other than that, I was like, I would give this a try, but see, I'm the kind of person that could consumes a lot of meat as is, like we talked about earlier. And so this is something that that I'm definitely open to. And I'm always open to using myself as a guinea pig to try new things anyway. Uh, but, you know, for my listeners, I think the reason why I really wanted to talk to you for everybody else is, is that, you know, these people are going to, they're going to be scratching their head about things like fiber and about things like vitamin C and all these other vitamins that you, they would think that you would be deficient in. And you talked extensively in your book, The Carnivore Diet, about scurvy and stuff like that that uh, that just is not the, you don't end up having the problems that you would think that you end up having with this nutrition so I just it was one of those things that I thought like well I'm giving people information here and they can listen and hopefully they'll, they'll sit and think critically about it and and uh, search out more information for that and if they wanted to doc where would where would they go to get more information about your carnivore diet other than your book the carnivore diet which I picked up on I think iBooks I read it on my read it on my, my online. Where else can they get the book and where else can they go to get information on your stuff? You know, the book is, I think, well, I don't know if it's still in the bookstores. I haven't, you know, I, I, I don't think I've even been to a bookstore since my book came out. Um, it's on Amazon. I mean, but, you know, as far as where I am, I mean, if you want to like directly talk to me, I'm, a, I'm at Rivero, Rivero.com every single day. We have, you can join up for free. We have a live meeting at 9 a.m. Pacific time every day, seven days a week. And we have, you know, anywhere between 30 and 100 people in there. We just chat, you know, I just talk about whatever anyone wants to talk about. So if you got a question you want to ask me directly, that's the best way to do it. Um, you know, I've got obviously a number of social media accounts that, you know, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, I kind of put stuff up there most days. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, listen, I, I tell you what, I, you know, the next time I'm up in Seattle, I'll uh, I'll give you a shout or something like that. Maybe we can get on the mat and do a little bit of training together too. Yeah, we'll be just there. We need some states and I've got some mats in my garage. <laughs> hey, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll come, uh, you make me some, I'll come out and teach, teach you, teach you a lesson and you make me some steaks and it's a fair trade, man. That's the best appropriate trade. Thanks. Rich. That'd be great. All right. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. Appreciate, appreciate chatting with you today. Thanks doc. White Franklin is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor legal advice, nor a statement of quite Franklin policy. 
Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of that product or entity by Rich Franklin or Quite Franklin. The views expressed by guests on the podcast are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by Quite Franklin employees or representatives are the views and opinions of the persons expressing them, and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Quite Franklin or any of its officials or principals. Nothing heard on this podcast at any time is medical advice or is intended as medical advice. The listener must always consult his or her personal physician or other qualified medical professional regarding any questions of a medical nature. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact our general counsel.